This is Michael from Blue Sky Bio. I would like to welcome everybody who's joining us for the webinar tonight. You should be able to hear me clearly through your computer speakers. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can enter them into the chat box on the bottom right of the screen, and they'll be answered during the course of the webinar. The CE credits for the webinar will be issued within one week via email, so you should check your email for the certificate for the CE credit. Uh, barring any technical difficulties, a recording of the webinar will be available on the Blue Sky Bio website within a few days after the webinar. I'm happy to say that uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening going on at Blue Sky Bio. We recently released Astro-compatible CONUS-12 implants. We're working on innovative drilling solutions for implants in general and computer-guided software in particular. And we're also working on a fantastic new release of the software, which is scheduled for the beginning of 2013. One of the aspects that contributes to the exciting times is our partners use the software to innovate and push the limits of computer-guided surgery to improve the process for the dentists and the benefits for the patients. One such company is Guided Surgery Solutions, who developed a thin guide surgical template. Dr. Jerome Haber, one of the co-founders of Guided Surgery Solutions, will be presenting the new thin guide system, its advantages, and the protocol for dental implant surgery. Without any further ado, I'd like to hand the controls over to Dr. Haber. Michael, thank you very much for your introduction and for hosting this webinar. As we all know, the best technology for safely and accurately placing implants is guided surgery, where a drill guide containing a guide tube is constructed based on 3D imaging and implant planning software. When tube guides work, the results are phenomenal. However, there are problems with the technology, and guided surgery has not been widely adopted, most likely due to technical limitations and cost. I use tube guides on many cases. In response to my experiences with tube guides, I developed the tubeless thin layer guide to address the limitations of tube guides, which we will discuss. We conducted a survey of 12,000 implant dentists in the US, and the results of this survey validated my impressions. Today, I would like to discuss some of the issues associated with guided surgery, review our survey results, and introduce a novel 3D-based drill guide system. Tube guides, or any guide that, that uh, guides a drill trajectory, works in the following way, tube guides. Um, a drill trajectory basically is point A, point B, connected by a straight line. In a guide tube, the top surface of the guide tube defines point A, and the bottom defines point B. And both of these are in the same device, and so when you place a drill within the guide tube, it's guided along the chosen trajectory, and that thus an osteotomy is created. With the thin guide, the thin layer guide, the upper and lower points of trajectory are defined in sequence. And so initially, an insertion point on the gingiva or bone, it can be a bleeding point, it can be a small pilot hole, is created. And then we take a thin layer guide, which is analogous to the top of the guide tube, as the other point of the trajectory. And when you connect these two points by putting the tip of the drill in the pilot hole and, the, and the, another portion of the drill through the guide tube, you now have a defined trajectory and you can drill and prepare an osteotomy. And this is quite different from the conventional tube guide. The limitations of tube guides are known by anyone who has used them. As I said before, I'm an advocate of tube guides. They work great. It's just that they don't work great in all the situations we need them to work in. In our survey of 800, uh, actually 12,000 doctors, we had 875 respondents. They described the limitations of tube guides. And basically, its limitation is you don't have visual and physical access 
to the surgical site. Oftentimes, many tube guides have a large flange. And the doctors, pretty much all of the doctors, acknowledged they wanted physical and visual access to the surgical site. Another major issue is the need for increased vertical space. 77% were frustrated by the need for clearance. And more interestingly, they noted that in 30% of their cases, they didn't order a guide because of their concerns about vertical clearance. And finally, the cost of the guide and a surgical kit are quite high, and our respondents indicated that these costs were too high to use in one to two implant cases. And perhaps the most intriguing number was that they indicated 18% of the guides that they have received are discarded at surgery. So first we went after that. We said, why are 18% of guides discarded? And based on, my, on the experience that I've had and in speaking to other surgeons, it comes down to, I think, four items. One is planning error. Oftentimes, you plan the case virtually, everything looks perfect, and then you come to the mouth, and clinically it just doesn't look right. So sometimes there's a discordance between your virtual plan and actually what you see when you look live in the patient's mouth. Secondly, inadequate vertical space. Sometimes the guides don't fit, poor fit, they rock. And the fact that you can't modify this guide once you have it, if you get to surgery and say, well, I think I'd like the osteotomy a half a millimeter this way or that way, or a millimeter this way or that way, with a tube guide, you, you cannot change it. Either you go with the trajectory the tube guide gives you, or you can't use the guide. So if we just go look at planning error, what are the issues associated with planning error? Because these guides are based on the plan. It's like a computer. What you put in is what you get out. And in this situation, if the plan is not precise, if it's not accurate relative to the actual patient anatomy, then the drill guide will not be usable. Well, I think one of the issues could be is many plans are based solely on osseous anatomy, where while you're planning the case, you can't see the outline of the gingiva, you can't see the opposing tooth, you can't see adjacent teeth. Secondly, there seems to be a perceptual difficulty looking at 3D images in two dimensions. This issue was described to me by the owner of a large digital dental lab who indicated that they face this problem when designing crowds virtually. And it took, there's a learning curve here in which to overcome this issue, but to be aware of it is very important. And finally, plans based on 3D image with scatter can be a problem. Sometimes critical anatomy is obliterated, or the merge, the data merge may not be accurate. So if you have a scan and there's enormous amounts of scatter and you have anatomy that's obliterated, perhaps that's not a case in which to do guided surgery. With Blue Sky Plan and Guided Surgery Solutions Enhanced Tools, I think that we are able to reduce the planning error. And this is, these are the tools that would be available in order to do that. The plan is based on merged data, showing the osseous anatomy, gingiva, and teeth. Plans can be based on anatomy of the opposing dentition, anatomy of a temporary or permanent prosthesis, a full denture, or an edentulous ridge. We've also introduced the ability to plan on the basis of reference marks, showing pilot hold entry points that are in ideal anatomical positions. Radiographic stents are usually not needed, and we have a scanning protocol for cases with scatter where we still can obtain accurate merges. This slide illustrates some of the enhanced tools that we have available using Blue Sky Plan. It's an extremely powerful software package and enables us to, to do what we're showing you. In the top left panel, we can see a cross section of a mandible with an implant in place. But we also can see the outline of the gingiva. We can see an outline of the opposing tooth. And in this case, you can see where we have the uh, implant lined up a mandibular molar implant lined up with the lingual cusp 
of an upper molar is as it should be. In the center panel, there is an image, a 3D image of an articulated dentition. On the top right panel, we have an image of the edentulous area and the adjacent tooth. And you can see a reference mark. And that's a mark in that model which represents the ideal position for the placement of that implant. We also can use the abutments as virtual teeth. For molars, I usually set them at 10 millimeters. They can be whatever you wish them to be. It could be 9 for a smaller molar, 11 for a larger molar. And so you can look 3D on the actual model and see what the relationship would be between your future tooth and the adjacent teeth. And I think these enhanced tools will go a long way to minimizing planning error. The vertical space issue is one that everyone is familiar with. A tube guide re re requires you to stack the drill above the tube. The kicker is, is that we don't always measure the maximum inner incisal opening of our patients as part of our pre-surgical plan. And so you have situations where the issue is not appreciated until the surgical appointment, at which point the guide is discarded. But the tube guides can easily add six, seven, eight, nine millimeters of vertical height requirement to a case. The thin layer guide addresses these issues by its design. First, we provide a snug-fitting disposable drill stop. And these are made custom for, a different, for any drill system that might be used. So the first step would be to use an insert with an endophile or a sharp burr and create a bleeding point. And this replicates the ideal insertion point for the case. So you create a bleeding point. Then the drill, a sharp, we use a, sal, a salvin spear drill, is inserted through the guide. The drill stop engages the guide hole, and you can now create a pilot hole. The tip of the drill goes into the bleeding point or the initial and creates a pilot hole. You then place your two millimeter pilot drill, and you insert the drill through the guide hole, but you can do it as an angle. So if you place it at an angle, you now require no more vertical clearance than you would freehand drilling. In other words, if the drill and the handpiece will fit in someone's mouth without a guide, it will fit in their mouth with a thin layer guide. So you drag the tip of the drill along the gingiva, insert it into the pilot hole, and drill to depth, as seen in the lower right panel. This procedure would then be, would be repeated with drills of increasingly large diameters. We advocate that measurement of the patient's vertical opening should be part of the surgical plan, part of the pre-surgical workup, because this dictates whether surgery can be done or it can't be done, or if it can be done, this will dictate the length of your drill and the maximum length of the implant that you can use. And it varies for different drill systems, and it varies depending on the size of the head of your handpiece. So in this, this is a chart which we are, have constructed, and it's just a, a small sample of our database, where we can tell you, if you tell us, we, in, in order to use our system, we need you to give us the specs on your handpiece. And we'll measure the handpiece, we'll measure the insertion of the drill into the handpiece and know precisely the vertical space needed for a given handpiece and a given drill. And in that way, we can tell you that if you use a drill length, in this example, a Blue Sky Bio short of 32 and a half millimeters in a specific handpiece, we can say, well, under those circumstances, your maximum implant length is 10 millimeters, say. And so, again, this should be all part of pre-surgical planning. And in my experience, it has not been part of pre-surgical planning, and I think that's why a number of these cases, in a number of these cases, the guides are discarded because of lack of vertical clearance, because this was not worked out ahead of time. 